Are we there yet? Whether we've said this on the journey from the back or heard it from the front, this question is as old as travel itself. But a few weeks ago, it wasn't so much what was said on the road, but what happened when we arrived. We'd gone to see some Shakespeare in Stratford, as you do, but the drama that night didn't end when we left the theatre. Getting to our destination on the wonderfully named Hamlet Way was straightforward, as was checking in. So we went up to our room, I inserted the card in the door, and then I heard a voice saying, excuse me, there was a man in our room, quietly sitting there, having his McDonald's. He was polite, but equally he didn't gather up his burger and fries and let us in. He was there for the night as far as he was concerned, so I went to reception to see what we should do. I approached the desk and said, there's a man in our room. He looked at me and repeated my words back to me. There's a man in your room. At which point she marched past me, keys in hand, Sybil Fawlty-esque to our room, knocked on the door and spoke to the man in our room, who, it transpired, was working for the company. His job, I kid you not, was to deal with the evacuation procedures, and didn't inspire much confidence that the person assigned to get us out of the place was in the wrong place, and that was in our room. You had to be there, really, but you weren't. So my story of what happened that night is what you've got to go on. Thomas must have so wished that he'd been there that night when a man appeared in their room that they could never expect to have been there. But this man hadn't been there by mistake. He was there by the miraculous power of Almighty God and all the disciples had seen him, except for Thomas. He had not been there on that first Easter Sunday evening, but everybody else had, and he had been feeling a bit left out. All of us here today have something in common. We weren't there either. Just like Thomas the first time, we, in a very different time, weren't there when the Lord appeared in the room. But a number of us can say we weren't there yet, we have seen him. This is the first of three points I want us to unpack today. Secondly, we'll go on to see that we weren't there, yet we can believe in him. And thirdly, we weren't there, yet we will worship him. So let's take the first of those. We weren't there, yet we have seen him. Jesus said to Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. As a child, I had a book called I Wish I Lived When Gideon Did. It was part of a series wishing we'd lived when various Bible characters had. Nice idea, but we didn't. So we have to get on with it in the era the Lord has put us in. The only way we can do that, though, is to have seen the Lord by faith at work in our lives. To look back and see the difference he has made and to see him working things out in a way that only he could do in the present. Those of us who are Christians listening to this can say, like Thomas, that we weren't there either when Jesus first appeared to his disciples. Yet we have seen him at work in our own lives. We have seen him answer prayer. We have seen him change the lives of others whom we thought could never have been changed. And we have seen him work out our own lives in a way we could never have thought possible. I typed out that sentence and then I asked the Lord for an illustration to back it up. I then opened the curtains and saw the dark billowing clouds moving along serenely. And they reminded me of Job in the Bible. Job could be described as the proverbial cartoon character who was always under a cloud while the sun was out for everyone else. But what Job went through was no laughing matter. The loss of his family, his business, his purpose, 
but the messages he heard from God recorded towards the end of the book that bears his name make for extraordinary reading. Did you know the word clouds appears in Job more than any other Old Testament book? Listen to what God said to Job. Do you know how God controls the clouds and makes his lightning flash? Do you know how the clouds hang poised, those wonders of him who has perfect knowledge? At this point, I left my screen for half an hour, and when I came back to it, I looked out of the window again. Those heavy, dark clouds had gone, replaced by a clear blue sky. There were still clouds there in the distance, but the outlook was very different to what I had seen the first time. This is a picture of Job, but look at what he had said in the very last chapter of the book, despite all he'd been through earlier on. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. These words, to come back to Easter, could easily have been said by Thomas. He'd heard about what the others had seen and would have struggled for the whole week that followed. But when he saw the Lord himself, the clouds were lifted and the Son of God before him would have been a sight to behold that he would never forget. Have you seen God at work in your life? If so, how would you describe it to someone else? And if not, it's not too late if you're open to the Lord and his great love for you. As we've heard, Jesus said, blessed are those who have seen, who have not seen, rather, and yet have believed. Which leads us on to our second point. We weren't there, yet we can believe in him. Thomas has said in verse 25, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Again, we didn't live when Thomas did, so we don't have that option. But we do have the choice of believing in the Lord. And as the Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. We will be saved from an eternity without him. For that is the destiny in the next life of all that do not believe in him in this one. But God loved the world so much. He gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. It may be that like Thomas, we have our own reasons for not believing the state of the world, the hurt in our lives, even, sadly, the bad example of those who say they do. Perhaps you want to believe, but you don't feel you can. I would like to encourage you that you can believe, and with God's help, you can go on believing until you do see him face to face, more of which shortly. There's a song in one of our songbooks which goes like this. I believe in Jesus. I believe he is the Son of God. I believe he died and rose again. I believe he paid for us all. And I believe he's here now, standing in our midst, here with the power to heal now and the grace to forgive. If you believe that, I'd like you to take a few minutes at some stage on this Easter day and think just what that means to you. And if you don't believe that, I'd like you to take a few minutes on this day and consider why not. For Jesus, Son of God, died and rose again for you. He's here now for you. He has the power to transform you and the grace to forgive you. Do you believe this? That question is one that the Lord Jesus himself asked a grieving Martha at the tomb of her dead brother, Lazarus. He'd said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. 
and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Within minutes, Jesus would raise her brother Lazarus from the dead. And before long, the Lord himself would be raised from the dead also. There's a line in the account of the raising of Lazarus, which I've often used in funeral services. Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? With respect, I've told you a number of times that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Now it's over to you to do so. A number of years ago, a man called Jonathan Whitfield was preaching to the coal miners. He asked one man, what do you believe? Well, he said, I believe the same as the church. Oh, said Jonathan, and what does the church believe? Well, he said, they believe the same as me. Seeing he was getting nowhere, Whitfield said, and what is it that you both believe? Well, he said, I suppose the same thing. If you want to know what Goodwood believes, we have a leaflet available. And if you want to know some, if you want someone else to know what the church believes, you can give it to them. For on this leaflet is contained what we believe as Christians. And it's this belief which is a passport to experiencing our third and final point. We weren't there yet, we will worship him. If we believe, we will see the glory of God. Thomas had said to the others, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And now Jesus is standing right in front of him and says, in effect, go on then. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Two things here I'd not thought about before. Firstly, he'd never said this to Jesus, but the Lord knew exactly what Thomas had said when he challenged him. Secondly, we don't know if Thomas actually did that, but we do know what he said, for we read in verse 28, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. This was worship based on what he'd seen but encourages those in the future, right down to you and me, that we are blessed if we have not seen and yet have believed. If we are Christians listening to this, we are blessed. We are so blessed. As Paul writes to the Ephesians, we are blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. There's another verse to unpack when you finish the first one. For if we belong to the Lord Jesus, we are blessed not only with what we believing in the Lord Jesus brings, the one who came from heaven to earth, but in knowing what he will one day give us, passage from earth to heaven, where we will worship him in ways beyond anything we could ever experience in this life. And if like Thomas at the start of our passage today, you will not believe because you haven't, seen the Lord yet, like your friends have. Can I encourage you that whilst you weren't there in the past, you will worship him in the future if you believe in him in the present. Towards the end of writing this, I had an email entitled Your Stay at Stratford-upon-Avon, which said, how was your stay? We hope you enjoyed it and would love to hear about your recent experience with us. Well, it was entertaining, we can certainly say that. Are we there yet? You may be asking regarding the end of this talk. Well, as I draw to a close, I would humbly ask, are you there yet? When it comes to the believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, in a sense, none of us are there yet in this life. Even those, who, those of us who have faith will continue to wrestle with doubt and sin. But are you there yet when it comes to putting your trust in the Lord Jesus, who gave his life for you, who loves you so much? Are you ready to give your life to him? 
If you are, a simple prayer will do. Father, forgive me for the sin in my life which separates me from you. I believe in you and what you have done in taking my sin upon yourself at the cross. Come into my life and help me to go on believing in you. And if you have done that, can I encourage you that the worship to our Lord and our God, which makes Easter Day so special, is just a shadow of what's in store when faith turns to sight and we're in heaven, where the worship never ends and we'll say, ah, we're there. Amen.